This is the VOA Special English Technology Report. Much has been done to improve security in the United States since the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001. Intelligence sharing and cooperation between federal, state, and local government agencies is said to be at an all-time high. There have also been improvements in airport security, but a new report says the United States is not as safe as it should be. It says America is not yet prepared for a truly catastrophic disaster. The report is from the National Security Preparedness Group at the Bipartisan Policy Center. The group. Is led by former New Jersey Governor Thomas Kane and former Congressman Lee Hamilton of Indiana. The two men also led the 9/11 Commission. Congress established the commission to investigate the hijacking attacks and to make proposals for guarding against future attacks. The new report. Noted that nine of the reforms proposed by the commission have either been carried out ineffectively or completely ignored. For example, the 9/11 Commission found that communication problems were a major issue during the attacks ten years ago. Police, firefighters, and medical crews. Had trouble talking to each other because they were using different radio frequencies. Officials said this lack of communication led to needless loss of life. The commission said the government should identify radio frequencies that would be used only for emergency communications. However. This has yet to be done. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton commented on the report. She said radio frequencies for first responders was an issue she had worked on in the Senate and is long overdue for completion. On another issue, border security, she said, "We have emphasized innovation." For example, we are now using sophisticated new biometric screening tools to improve border security and the visa process. The report praised the deployment of U.S. Visit, a biometric entry system in the United States. The U.S. Visit system uses digital fingerprints and photographic images. To identify people entering the United States, the report notes that a similar system for those leaving the country has yet to be established. It says such a system could have helped officials find two of the hijackers involved in the 9/11 attacks. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. To read and listen to more stories and to learn English, go to VOA Special English dot com. This is the VOA Special English Development Report. The earliest process of making paper was done almost five thousand years ago in Egypt and the Nile Valley. In those days, paper was made from strips of the papyrus plant. Modern papermaking began in China about 2,000 years ago. This process produced paper from cloth, straw, wood, or the bark of trees. The raw materials are struck over and over until they become loose. Then they are mixed with water. After the water has been removed, the flat, thin form remaining. Is permitted to dry. This becomes a sheet of paper. Large machines 
started to be used for making paper near the end of the 16th century. Today, paper making is a big business, but it is still possible to make paper by hand since the steps are the same as using big machines. You should choose paper with small amounts of printing. Old envelopes are good for this reason. Colored paper can also be used, as well as small amounts of newspaper. Small pieces of rags or cloth can be added. These should be cut into pieces about five centimeters by five centimeters. Everything is placed in a container, covered with water, and brought to a boil. It is mixed for about two hours with some common chemicals and then allowed to cool. Then it is left until most of the water dries up. The substance left, called pulp can be stored until you are ready to make paper. When you are ready, the pulp is mixed with water again. Then the pulp is poured into a mold. The mold is made of small squares of wire that hold the shape and thickness of the paper. To help dry the paper, the mold lets the water flow through the small wire squares. After several more drying steps, the paper is carefully lifted back from the mold. It is now strong enough to be touched. The paper is smoothed and pressed to remove trapped air. You can use a common electric iron used for pressing clothes. There are many other technologies for people making paper using small machines. More information about making homemade paper can be found on the internet. You can also order information on paper making through the website enterpriseworks.org. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Persuti. Transcripts, MP3s, and podcasts of our reports are at voaspecialenglish.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and iTunes at VOA Learning English. This is the VOA Special English Technology Report. Solar water heaters are used around the world and are not very difficult to build. The system we are going to describe is based on a design developed some years ago in Afghanistan. Since then, it has been built and used in many countries. It can heat 70 liters of water to 60 degrees Celsius. It can do this between sunrise and noon on a clear day with an average air temperature of 32 degrees Celsius. There are two parts to the solar water heater. One part is made of a sheet of metal painted black. Black surfaces become hotter in the sun than surfaces painted any other color. This black metal plate is called a collector. The collector is placed in contact with the water. There are several kinds of metal sheets that can be used for the collector. Corrugated metal will work very well. Corrugated sheets are often used as roofs on housing. Once the water is heated, it is kept hot with insulation material. This allows the water to stay warm for a long time. The second part of the solar water heater holds the water for the system. This storage tank can be a container 
that holds about 100 liters. Two rubber pipes are attached to the water storage tank. One pipe lets water flow into the system. The other lets water flow out. When the water heater is working correctly, water will flow from the storage tank to the collector and back again. You can use the hot water at the top of the tank for washing and cleaning. You can change the flow of water so that the temperature is hot or warm as desired. This solar water heater is easy to build and operate. It will last about two years before the rubber pipes need to be replaced. There is also something else you will need to make the solar water heater work, the sun. As you might expect, the heater will heat water only on sunny days. You can get more information about solar water heaters and other projects from Enterprise Works Vita. This group works internationally to fight poverty. The website is enterpriseworks.org. Choose the link for news and resources, then click on Publications. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. To read and listen to more stories about technology and for English teaching activities, go to voaspecialenglish.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and iTunes at VOA Learning English. From VOA Learning English, this is the Technology Report in Special English. Chinese companies Huawei and ZTE have pushed back against accusations that they present a national security threat to the United States. The companies are part of China's telecommunications industry. The House Intelligence Committee released a report on the issue last week. Committee Chairman, Republican Congressman Mike Rogers, spoke about the year-long investigation that led to the report. He said, the investigation concluded that the risks associated with these companies providing equipment and services to U.S. critical infrastructure undermines the core U.S. national security interests. Dutch Rupersberger, a Democrat, is a ranking member of the House Committee. He said, We already know the Chinese are aggressively hacking into our nation's networks, threatening our critical infrastructure. He also said the Chinese were stealing millions of dollars worth of trade secrets and other sensitive information from American companies. The report warned American companies against doing business with Huawei and ZTE. It also called on the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States to block any purchases, takeovers, or mergers involving the two companies. And it advised officials in the United States to ban the use of equipment from these companies in their systems. Both Huawei and ZTE released statements last week denying the claims in the report. They said it is an attempt to prevent Chinese companies from competing in the American market. Chinese officials also reacted to the report. China's Commerce Ministry called the report's findings untrue. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. 
This is the VOA Special English Development Report. Each year since 2001, the American State Department has published a Trafficking in Persons Report. It measures efforts by countries to fight human trafficking. This year's report adds the United States for the first time. The Federal Bureau of Investigation says people are being trafficked into major cities nationwide. Tim Whitman at the FBI is an expert on the problem. He says about 20% of the cases involve victims from Mexico, the largest number of any foreign country. Bradley Miles is with the Polaris Project, an organization that fights trafficking. He calls it a very serious problem in the United States. He says some of the victims are forced to work in homes of the wealthy and at restaurants. Activists say some cases of modern slavery involved forced labor in agriculture. But more than 80% of suspected incidents involve the sex trade. That was the finding of a study by the Human Smuggling and Trafficking Center established by Congress. The Polaris Project operates a telephone hotline that receives calls from around the country, from states such as Texas, California, New York, and Florida. Bradley Miles says one of the top five cities where calls come from is Washington. Victims in the nation's capital include women from South Korea, China, and Latin America. Some victims are American citizens. Deborah Sigmund started a group called Innocence at Risk. She says most of the victims of human trafficking come from economically troubled countries. She said they want to think that they can come to America and have a great job, so it's very easy to fool them. Tim Whitman says the smugglers often threaten their victims and make it difficult for them to pay their debts. The threat may be against their family back in their home country. But there are other ways to pressure victims to stay. He said a common threat is if you leave, I'm going to report you to immigration and you'll be arrested. You'll be kept in prison for a long time. But there is help. Victims of human trafficking can sometimes get a special visa. It permits them to stay in the United States for up to four years. During that time, they can request to stay permanently. But with threats, a language barrier, and fear of the legal system, victims are often unwilling or unable to seek help. And that's the VOA Special English Development Report. I'm Mario Ritter with the VOA Special English Development Report. The latest Global Hunger Index report says the number of hungry people worldwide has fallen 25% since 1990. Last year, the estimate topped 1 billion people for the first time. But this year's report says the number of people not getting enough to eat has fallen to 925 million. Still, many experts worry that hunger rates are not falling fast enough to meet United Nations goals. One of the first of the Millennium Development Goals is to reduce the hunger rate by 50% between 1990 
and 2015. Caroline Herford at the UN World Food Program says, the reduction in hunger rates has slowed in recent years. She says there was a small decrease in the number of hungry people in the late 1990s. But then it rose again during the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. And then high food prices together with high fuel prices caused more problems. And climate change has made it more difficult to grow food. The Global Hunger Index is prepared by three private organizations based in Germany, the United States, and Ireland. The latest report says 29 countries have levels of hunger that are considered alarming. The biggest increases were found in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The report says hunger has risen by more than 65% since 1990 because of conflict and political insecurity. And Caroline Herford says Congo is not alone. She says conflict is a huge problem that affects the ability to grow crops. People cannot tend their fields if they are always being chased away by armed rebels. A separate report says 22 countries have suffered from a hunger and food crisis for at least eight years. 20% of the world's hungry people live in these countries, most of which are in Africa. That report is from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Food Program. They say new policies are needed to deal with these long-term crises. Peter Smerden at the World Food Program says emergency aid must include development assistance. Both reports were released ahead of World Food Day, October 16th. For VOA Special English, I'm Mario Ritter. Transcripts, MP3s, and podcasts of our reports are at voaspecialenglish.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at VOA Learning English. This is the VOA Special English Technology Report. Controlling a device with your mind. Powering your home with the energy of your own activities. These are two of the developments that experts at IBM think will become reality within the next five years. The technology company has released its latest five in five report. The experts think people will soon be able to control many electronic devices simply by using their minds. Scientists at IBM and other companies are researching ways to do this in a field of science known as bioinformatics. They say people will soon have a way to just Think about calling or emailing someone in order to make it happen. Bernie Meyerson is IBM's Vice President of Innovation. He says the idea is for something with really deep capability so that a person, for instance, a quadriplegic, a paraplegic, can actually utilize brain waves to make things happen, and basically run their own lives independently. Another prediction is a way for people to power their homes and offices using energy from activities like walking or running. 
Still another prediction, passwords could soon become a thing of the past. IBM says developments in biometric technology could soon make passwords unnecessary. Some of the most common biometrics used to identify people are fingerprints, face and voice recognition, and iris scans. The iris is the colored part of the eye. Bernie Meyerson says this technology will soon be more widely used by money machines and other devices. Another prediction from the experts at International Business Machines, better technology to prevent unwanted email. The fifth prediction on IBM's five in five list is an end to the digital divide between those who have technology and those who do not. Bernie Meyerson says, we anticipate within five years, better than 80% coverage of the world's population by cellular to smartphones. At that point, imagine having, for instance, the ability to speak openly with anybody, anywhere, anytime, and any language. Real-time translation. Literally, the old Star Trek idea of the universal translator coming to be and how the world would change if there were that kind of communication and openness. And that's the VOA Special English Technology Report. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. This is the VOA Special English Technology Report. ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, has released a list of proposed new domain names. A generic top-level domain, or GTLD, is the part of an internet address after the dot, like .com or .org. Currently, there are 22 of these top-level domains in use, but they're soon could be as many as a thousand or more. Rod Beckstrom is president of ICANN. He says the organization received almost 2,000 requests for new domains during the application period, which ended in May. He called the release an historic day for the internet and for more than two billion people around the world who depend on it. He said the internet is about to change forever. More than 900 of the requests for new generic top-level domains came from North America. Only 17 were from Africa. Each application required a payment of $185,000. Some businesses like Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Google applied for domain name extensions. Dot app was one of the most sought after names. ICANN received 13 requests for the right to own that one. There were three applications for dot dog, but none for dot cat, dot love, dot wedding, dot sexy, and dot porn also made the list of proposed top level domains. But Mr. Beckstrom says no names are guaranteed. These are just applications that are not yet approved, and some may not be. In his words, none of them will enter the internet until they have undergone a rigorous, objective, and independent evaluation. ICANN began a 60-day comment period when it released the list in June.
It also began a seven-month objection period. An ICANN spokesman said this is for anyone who wants to oppose an application for a domain name. The spokesman said objections will be decided in a formal, independent dispute resolution process. ICANN says it will begin processing the applications for new top-level domain names in batches of 500 at a time. The first group is not expected to begin operating until the first part of 2013. ICANN will approve no more than 1,000 new generic top-level domain names each year. ICANN apologized for accidentally publishing some of the contact details of those requesting new domains. ICANN admitted placing the mailing addresses and contact information for some individuals on its website. The group has since removed that information. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. From VOA Learning English, this is the Technology Report. Researchers have developed an experimental iPhone application or app that they say can improve the chances of survival from a heart attack. The iPhone app is designed to identify patients suffering from a kind of heart attack known as a STEMI, or ST elevation myocardial infarction. In a STEMI, blood flow to the heart is stopped because of a blockage in a coronary artery. Unlike other kinds of heart attacks, STEMIs show up very clearly on an electrocardiogram or ECG. Doctors use ECGs to measure electrical activity in the heart. The experimental iPhone app should help rescuers reacting to a possible medical emergency. They can perform an ECG and then take a picture of the test results with the camera on the telephone. They can then send that information ahead to hospital emergency room doctors. The iPhone app is the work of David Burt and his students at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. He says the app can help save lives by preparing doctors for the arrival of the STEMI patient as early as possible. He says doctors can mobilize their system so that they can perform a catheterization to unblock the artery or some other treatment. David Burt and his team tested the app 1,500 times over three American cellular telephone networks in a populated area. He said the app was successful within less than 10 seconds, about 94% of the time. The developers are now testing the iPhone app in rural areas where cell phone reception is more problematic than in cities. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is the VOA Special English Development Report. The World Health Organization says obesity rates are rising in Pacific Island countries. So, too, are health problems linked to being overweight. The WHO says a major reason for the rising obesity rates is an increase in imported foods. 
It says many Pacific Islanders have replaced their traditional diets of vegetables and fruits with imported processed foods. Dr. Temu Waganivalu is with the World Health Organization's South Pacific office in Suva, Fiji. He says many of the imported products lack nutritional value. But they are widely available, he says, and often cost less than healthier foods. He says, in some of the places, you'd be amazed to see how a bottle of Coke is cheaper than a bottle of water. Dr. Wagani Valu says the increase in imported foods is only part of the problem. He says problems with agriculture production limit the availability of healthier foods. And a lack of physical activity among many Pacific Islanders only adds to the obesity problem. The WHO says more than 50% of the population is overweight in at least 10 Pacific Island countries. The rate is as high as 80% among women in the territory of American Samoa. Fiji had the lowest obesity rate at 30%. In all, almost 10 million people live in Pacific Island countries. The WHO estimates that about 40% of them have health disorders related to diet and nutrition. Diabetes rates are among the highest in the world. 47% of the people in American Samoa have diabetes. So do 44% of the people in Tokelau, a territory of New Zealand. By comparison, the diabetes rate is 13% in the United States, a country that has its own problems with rising obesity. Officials also note an increase in nutritional problems like anemia and not enough vitamin A in the diets of Pacific Islanders. Dr. Wagani Valu says treating conditions related to obesity and diet puts pressure on limited health resources and budgets. Earlier this year, leaders of island nations met in Vanuatu for the first ever Pacific Food Summit. Dr. Wagani Valu says the issues are finally getting the attention they deserve. And that's the VOA Special English Development Report. You can post comments and find transcripts, MP3s, and podcasts of our programs at voaspecialenglish.com. This is the VOA Special English Development Report. Sending and receiving money by text message sharing crop prices, just talking to a loved one far from home. These are some of the ways that mobile phones have changed lives in developing countries. Another way is through e-health, electronic health services. One example is a telephone hotline in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Callers can receive information about family planning and the prevention of unwanted pregnancies. They are able to speak privately with trained operators about birth control methods and about health clinics. The nonprofit group Population Services International and a partner launched the service in 2005. The United States Agency for International Development finances the program, and an agreement with the Vodacom company makes the service free to callers. We talked with Jamaica Corker on her cell phone 
at the Population Services International Office in the DRC. She said, the hotline has given us an opportunity to take advantage of cell phone technology to reach people outside of our intervention zone with family planning messaging. The hotline allows them to call in no matter where they are and to ask us the information that we can provide. Jamaica Corker says more than 20,000 people called the hotline in 2008. More than 80% were men. She says this is mainly because men own most of the phones. The group also has family planning hotlines in Benin and Pakistan. And it is launching a mobile phone program to gather records on condom sales around Tanzania. The journal Health Affairs recently published an issue on e-health in the developing world. Editor Susan Denser says, e-health is improving lives in different ways. For example, in Rwanda, cell phone-based technologies are being used to keep track of drugs given to patients with HIV. Rwanda is at the leading edge of developing nations in using these technologies to advance health and health care. In South Africa, a campaign of text messages about HIV led to a large increase in calls to the National AIDS Helpline. And a program in Peru sends text messages to patients with HIV, reminding them to take their medicines. And that's the VOA Special English Development Report. Tell us about eHealth services where you are. You can share ideas and find our programs at voaspecialenglish.com. This is the VOA Special English Development Report. Mobile phones have revolutionized the way people connect, not only with family and friends, but also business services. A good example, services that let people use their phones to send and receive money. Two companies, Safaricom and Vodafone, launched the M-Pesa mobile money service in Kenya in 2007. Pesa means money in Swahili. The service operates much like a savings bank, which is important because plenty of Kenyans do not have bank accounts. Most of the early users were young men who worked in cities and wanted to send money home to rural areas. Now, customers can also use their M-Pesa accounts to pay bills, make purchases, or pay for services like taxis. Users pay a small amount for each transaction. Stephen Mbagua has a farm a half hour's drive from the capital. He uses M-Pesa to receive money from his son and to pay bills. He says, I used to go to Nairobi or to any bank to pay my bill. But now I don't go to Nairobi. I just pay my bill from here. Some businesses use the service to pay their employees. All across Kenya, there are stores and automated teller machines where M-Pesa users can add and withdraw money from their accounts. People can also transfer money to other mobile phone users, even those without an M-Pesa account. The other person receives a text message with a code to take to the local M-Pesa agent to get the money. All this pleases 22-year-old Felister Omari. She says, it's very fast. 
the M-Pesa, they're available everywhere. So once you are going somewhere, you can drop, get some cash, and proceed. M-Pesa is improving economic conditions for many Kenyan families. British-based Vodafone has also teamed with local companies to offer the service in Uganda and Afghanistan. Safaricom says nearly 8 million people in Kenya now use M-Pesa. That number is expected to grow as more people use mobile phones. A recent report predicted that the number of mobile phone accounts worldwide will reach almost four and a half billion this year. That is 12% more than last year and equal to two thirds of the world's population. The report was from the European Information Technology Observatory. The group says the strongest growth in mobile phone use now comes from newly industrialized and developing countries. And that's the VOA Special English Development Report. This is the VOA Special English Development Report. A new report says the illegal killing of rhinos for their horns is increasing in Africa and Asia. Rhinoceros poachers are killing an estimated two to three of the rare animals each week. Experts say demand in Asia, especially Vietnam and China, currently drives most trade in rhino horns from southern Africa. The horns are often used to make traditional medicines or handles for dagger knives. The report is from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and an organization known as Traffic. Most African rhino poaching is in Zimbabwe and South Africa. Experts found that 210 rhinos were illegally killed in South Africa in the last three years. The estimate for Zimbabwe is 235. The situation threatens gains made in its rhino populations in the 1990s. In the last two years, only six people were found guilty of poaching charges out of 41 arrested. In 2001, 68% of African rhino horns entering illegal trade were recovered. Eight years later, nine out of 10 rhino horns were heading to Asian markets without interference. The report says poaching and illegal horn trade has increased in South Africa, even with new measures against it. Adding to the problem, poachers today are more skilled at killing rhinos, and not only with guns. They also use quieter methods like drugs, poison, and crossbows. An international agreement on protecting endangered animals and plants provides for sport hunting of white rhinos in Africa but the horns often enter illegal markets. Not all the news is bad, however. The report notes that rhino populations are increasing in some areas. These include both white rhinos and black rhinos in the wild in Africa. Africa had an estimated 17,000 white rhinos and 4,000 black rhinos as of two years ago. Current estimates for Asia are around 3,000 rhinos. But even with poaching, growth is reported in some areas of India and Nepal. Wildlife activists are urging governments to do more to fight 
rhino poaching. The report was presented to the organization known as CITES. CITES is the Convention on International Trade This is the VOA Special English Development Report. Agricultural experts have launched a land and water management project in the Middle East. The project seeks to increase food security in dry areas. Researchers say the water availability in some of the areas has dropped well below the internationally recognized standard. Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, the West Bank, Syria, and Yemen are all taking part in the project. It is part of a larger 10-year effort called the Water and Livelihoods Initiative. The project is also expected to increase household income for farmers in the areas. The United States Agency for International Development provided $1 million for the Water and Livelihoods Initiative. Scott Christensen is an Agricultural Development Advisor with USAID. He helped develop the project while working for the International Center for Agricultural Research in the dry areas. He says, the countries taking part in the project were all carefully selected. He said they all share a socio-economic and cultural history. Research by the International Center for Agricultural Research in the Dry Areas and its partners has already proven to be successful. New irrigation methods are expected to double wheat production while using one-third of the water required for full irrigation. Experts say the new methods also increase crop production up to five times more than crops that depend on rainfall only. The International Center for Agricultural Research in the Dry Areas will provide technical support for the project. Officials from the International Water Management Institute and the International Food Policy Research Institute are also taking part in the effort. Each team will be joined by experts from local research institutions, universities, and government agencies. Scott Christensen said his group has good partnerships among the countries so that they can learn lessons from each other and work together effectively. He and other officials met in Amman, Jordan in February. They attended an international conference on food security and climate change in dry areas. Nearly one-fourth of the world's people live in these areas. Officials say more must be done to deal with water shortages in agriculture. If not, they say, the future of food security, economic development, and social stability in dry areas will be put at risk. And that's the VOA Special English Development Report. This is the VOA Special English Technology Report. The government in India is defending itself against charges of internet censorship. The move comes after the government last week asked companies like Facebook and Twitter to block more than 300 websites. 
officials accused the websites of posting edited images and videos of earthquake victims. They said the websites falsely claimed that the images were Muslim victims caught in recent ethnic conflict in India's northeastern Assam state and Burma. A number of the images were reportedly uploaded from Pakistan. Officials said the panic that resulted caused thousands of Hindu immigrants to flee the area. They feared that Muslims would answer the false reports with attacks of their own. Lawyer Pawan Duggal says this is the first time internet and mobile phone technology have been used to create fear in a community. He says India has to make cybersecurity the top concern for the nation. Unfortunately, India does not even have a national cybersecurity policy, he says, and there is no plan should this kind of emergency happen again. Powan Duggal also thinks India needs an army of its own cyber warriors. On Friday, India's Communication and Information Technology Minister dismissed claims that the government is trying to censor social media. But he did say misuse of social media has to be stopped. Pranesh Prakash is with the Center for Internet and Society, based in Bangalore. He says some of the web pages that have been blocked include official news websites. He says the current case appears to call for some action, but he thinks the government has gone too far. He says the effort is limiting good news reporting. Pranesh Prakash also says some of the websites were uploaded by people trying to let others know that the images were false. The government in India has called on social media companies to come up with a plan to keep offensive material off the web. Last year, it passed a law that requires companies to remove so-called objectionable content when requested to do so. A Google report says that last year, India topped the list of countries that make such requests. Supporters of online freedom have expressed concern that India may be restricting use of the web. About 100 million people in India use the internet. That is the third most in the world. For VOA Learning English, I'm Laurel Bowman.